Hello everyone. Now I'm back to continue spreading gossip about Bill Lee. So over the last few videos, we've taken a close look at his big wrinkly forehead and we've gone over how cute and angelic his curly cues are. Now it's time to talk about Bill's balls. So if you're somebody who's been listening to Frontline Assembly since perhaps the late 80s, you may have gotten to a point in his career where you were just like, whatever did happen to Bill Lieb's balls? Well, I've got the answer to that right here. And that answer is Carol Ann Lopsidovsky. Ha! No. I created a playlist on my... Uh, YouTube channel called The Jody Vision, where I've been sharing out the story of going into visionary state and how I've taken an interest in Bill Lieb. And so the first part of it would be the uh, the part where like, um, so I was going into visionary state and I didn't know it yet, right? So I thought I had this little boyfriend named Billy. And then the process of discovery is me moving to Denver having more of these visions. Then I went to meet him. And then I had sort of a time travel type of visionary slip where it, it kind of revealed itself to me. That's where I became aware that I've been going to visionary state. So I kind of think of that as the crazy making experience because coming into that, it just really makes me look crazy. It makes me feel crazy and it's just crazy. At any rate, um, by the time I saw Bill Lieb uh, in 2003, um, I still had a lot of curiosity about him. Like I found out he was married and, and this type of thing. Maybe that's why, you know, I couldn't possibly make a connection like that. But um, still felt like you know, I was curious about him because, you know, I do realize he is definitely the same person as Billy. And so at some point I get the urge to try to write him again. Then um, it took them till 2006 to start touring with Frontline Assembly, so I started going to their shows. So maybe 2006, seven, went and saw Frontline Assembly those two years, and, and then they came back with Delirium. So I had a few more opportunities. So um, I still have yet to share about that experience, but then I ended up moving to Montana and getting put in touch with Bill Lieb and getting to know his girlfriend, uh, Amelia, and getting to know his ex-wife Carol Ann a little bit better along with a number of other people so in that phase of my story I feel like um, that's where I discover a lot of things about Bill Lieb you know that you know I'm inevitably going to share some of this because it's just part of my life you know and so that's where I want to point out um, that it wasn't of my choosing to have Bill Lieb bestowed upon me it's like the other way around it was bestowed upon me um, he was put before me. I was asked not to forget who he is. And, um, and so it took a lot of things to make me want to go meet this dude. And, and so like, this is kind of what I'm being ridiculed for. Like, it's not okay, you know, for somebody like me with no social status to go up to somebody like him, who's a famous hot, sexy rock star. Cause like, now if I was like a pretty model, it'd be okay. Like people like that, they don't get ridicule. For trying to approach him but like someone like me so it's really a major you know social political issue you know so um so why bill you know because um i've explained that i've explained this quite a bit in my videos again uh i think he's just the perfect guy to fit the bill on every level if you look at my life story and you look at the kind of dad i had and you know uh these guys have both discovered industrial music and shared it with their friends and inspired a lot of people um, to look into it but at the same time they're both like big music collectors and enthusiasts so I feel like um, that's something that Bill has in common with my dad and I really don't see people like my dad around very much and so it's kind of like um, when we first started listening to Frontline Assembly my dad was the one that um, discovered them and and he really loved it so much he was just like wow you know if I ever meet Bill Lee, but give him a hug because he just thought this this was his music. It really, um, it's kind of something I've said earlier on too, is uh, sometimes we like people that we, we kind of relate to them. Maybe we see ourselves in them. 
And, and so Bill Lee was sounding like he was saying a lot of the type of stuff my dad would say, that kind of thing. They seem to have a similar mentality. So I kind of saw it more like as my dad's thing. And so it grew on me more and more over time, especially with the visions. Otherwise, you know, um, so it's just really important to understand that it's not like me to go out of my way to meet somebody like that, let alone, you know, people wonder, why do you keep talking about this? Well, that's what I've been trying to explain. So why, why, why? You know, and the thing is, is um, it really ties in with the overall discovery of the industrial music community. Because uh, that's where it um, starts with is me, you know, growing up listening to industrial music, kind of in an isolated place. So I grew up in the Florida Keys. You know, we're from Michigan. That's where my dad discovered um, all the music he uh, taught me about. But living in the Florida Keys, we were starting to pick up on things here and there. We're lucky enough to discover stuff like Front 242 and Skinny Puppy and the whole Wax Tracks thing even. Really, so, um, you know, being in isolation there, not having other friends my in my age group, to share this uh, particular interest with, you know, I couldn't wait to get to Denver, Colorado. So some of my dad's friends from Michigan went out there to be part of um, the industrial music thing they had because they had Temple of Psychic Youth. They ended up getting to know like Genesis Peorage. And so my dad went out there in 88 and got to meet them and stuff. So it just seemed like a good place to go and find my people. So like for me to come to Denver and I'm looking for my, you know, music scene, it seemed like it was already too late by the time I had a chance to really hang out with Bill Lieb. And so, so I feel like me wanting to meet Bill Lieb, you know, it helped expose me to what that community's like, you know, like going into Cafe Netherworld and, and seeing how people act around them and all the stuff people do. So, you know, I've been sharing all about that. So I kind of feel like, you know, it's just our karma to have met each other. And so, you know, there are certain things meeting him has made me have to realize and hopefully certain things that meeting me has helped make him realize, see? So now, it seems like one of the biggest messages I got, you know, so like I come in contact with these people. It seems like, you know, all these people want to do is tell me, there's something wrong with you, Jody. You know, you must be, you know, mentally ill or something, you know? So I feel like this is the message I get out of this group. Now, Bill Lee doesn't say it directly to me, but it comes from like his wife, you know, Mrs. Lopsidovsky. <laughs> And so the reason I came up with that joke, by the way, is because there was some little meme that said something like, you know, don't be afraid to cut people off, Lorena Bobbitt, right? And I thought that sounds like somebody else I know, you know, because I feel like what she did was she tried to uh, prevent us from making a connection. And I feel like in order to make her happy, he's actually going to have to, what you call, cut me off, you know, to make her happy. So, and along with that, you know, um, You might look at the direction his music career took. So anyway, so it kind of brought me into this environment. It made me aware of a lot of things at best. And so, um, so what do you have to do the shadow work? So that's what I wanted to get on is it makes you have to do the shadow work. Okay. That makes you have to look at what's wrong with you. And so I've had to look at what's wrong with me and I've talked all about, you know, uh, scapegoat abuse and all this type of stuff. Well, at the same time, you know, we want to look at what's wrong with you, right? So, so if you're Bill Lee, for example, um, <laughs> you're not a perfect angel either. So at any rate, um, actually, like when we talk about um, what was going on back in the day or anything that might sound embarrassing, like, okay, so Bill Lee's getting kind of a rock star mentality. He's wanting to what you call go out with these younger women and da, 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 da. It's really not that big a deal. You know what I mean? It's not like, you know, you're raping children. You're not throwing kittens and puppies off of a bridge, you know, it's not like that. Um, but, you know, um, having to do the shadow work means looking at yourself and looking at, you know, some of the foolish things you've done and looking at some of the ignorant things you've done and all that type of stuff. That's why I'm kind of ripping on Bill about Amelia. It's like, you know, so these guys are trying to tell me I'm crazy, but then I catch Bill uh, doing, the, to me, I think it's crazy, you know, like going on a dating website because you think, you know, you're a famous rock star and you're entitled to, to bang teenagers or something, you know, it's kind of weird to me. So like, you know, if that's the case, you know, I mean, I'm just saying what I understand, like I'm not saying what's a fact or anything, but like, you know, so that's what I'm going to be finding out later about Bill is stuff like this. And this is just because, you know, a lot of the stuff people tell me and it kind of adds up. But, you know, and looking at stuff like that, you know, like Bill Lee 
getting a divorce and getting sued and all this type of stuff. Um, I personally think that all belongs in his biography. It's stuff he really shouldn't be ashamed of. It's embarrassing. It's probably not stuff you want to think about, but this is the kind of stuff that happens to people when, um, you know, people get married at a young age, you know. You know, like that song I was playing and singing along to, um, All Men Are Liars, like, some of the lyrics was something like, you know, he was a young man. He was just a boy when he made the vow. He was just a boy when he made the vow. Well, even then, like maybe you were too young or, you know, it was too early on to make a decision like that. And so you turn yourself into a liar because you realize you shouldn't have got married and now you're lying to your wife about something all the time, right? So uh, my Kung Fu teacher, Master Tay, had a similar problem. He said he cannot be in a committed relationship because it turns them into a liar because it's hard for some people to make a commitment to one person and you know when you come into money and popularity and you see your friends playing the field and you want to play the field so I think a lot of people go through this and they want to play the field you know and then they come back to their ex-wife because they realize you know it was um it was more of a uh, what you call a temptation than anything else you know like like the one person who loved you is the person who married you in the first place. You might have that type of a, a situation for many people. So anyways, you know, as as far as um, gossiping about Bill Lieb goes, the, the stuff I know about him comes from people that have known him. Like, you know, the person that told me he's a, a liar was his ex-wife or the lady, if he remarried or then his wife. But you know what I'm saying? It's just... And, and the thing is, is... um. It's just really interesting how um, this all comes full circle. So that's why I just kind of want to use this um, talk to kind of give a heads up for what I have to share for the rest of my stories. Stuff that is kind of embarrassing, but I kind of want to remind you that, you know, um, I have an unusual type of compassion for Bill. So it's more like, you know, people have been laughing at me and I think we, he should laugh at himself too. And so what it does is it makes you what you call do the shadow work, okay? And um, so whether we're looking at our individual case, or we might be looking at the entire industrial music community. Like what's been happening to the industrial music community is now you got all these, these people coming up. Like, you know, there's stories about the guy from Rammstein. They're more like a commercial industrial band. There's stories about the singer from Rammstein, uh, what do you call, date rape, you know, doing those date rape drugs, you know. And then now there's the singer from Three Teeth. Um, there's rumors about him doing date rape on girls. So these guys, you know, it, it's like you have a position of power and it's really easy to get these chicks in bed. And like some of these chicks will say stuff like, well, I felt like, you know, you know, it's Till, you know, from Rammstein. I have to let them, you know, have sex with me. You know, I can't tell them no. So people don't want to say no to this guy or something. So, you know, whether it's true or not, this is the kind of rumors you hear about guys like, well, I haven't heard any stories like that about Bill Lieb, actually, you know, it just sounds to me like the only embarrassing thing you can say is like he cheated on his wife, you know, with some chick, some teenage chick he met on the internet. And that's such a common event, you know, it happens to so many people. And a lot of times the reason is because the marriage has gone bad. And a lot of times when it's a marriage where, you know, the, the woman, uh, like the, if the power's tipping in her direction and it feels like she's getting too controlling. So that's what I was kind of figuring. Maybe, maybe she was getting too controlling. And that's why, you know, when, uh, back in 98, we ran into that whole situation, you know? So at any rate, um, what I want to talk about since, okay, so I got to look at, you know, why am I mentally ill? So I've talked a lot about what I'm, what I think, you know, has been my problem, you know, like growing up with the all these different things and, you know, like there could be some traumatic, uh, what do you call, post-traumatic stress disorder to some degree, you know, stuff like that, you know, when you have traumatic experiences, sometimes it can uh, make you a little different, make you more sensitive and temperamental and this type of thing. So, you know, um, so just for fun, I, I try to make a like a pie chart, you know. To explain what is causing mental illness. Now I want to explain that what you know I define as mental illness is like if you're if you have a good state of mental wellness, it's because you're doing good. Uh, you feel good, but poor a poor state of mental health is really being depressed, right? You know, um, at any rate, uh, 
I really have a strong issue with the depression. You know, I, I try to keep smiling. I try to have fun and be uplifting to others, but I, I struggle with depression the most. So at any rate, let me show my graph or my pie chart of the cause of my mental illness. I would say a small degree of it has been that my personal needs are not being met. So I don't really feel so much that going into visionary state as a problem for me. I really enjoy it. I think it's fun knowing that it can happen. It's an interesting revelation. And it gives us confirmation for so many reasons about visionary state and how it works. So it's really cool and stuff. But like the, the thing that it does that I don't like would be... Um, I feel like I was tricked into trying to, to get in touch with Bill Lieb and... And so basically what's happening is my prophecies are not being fulfilled and that's to be understood because part of them are true and part of them are false anyways. But the problem is it has also made it difficult for me to connect with other people. Like if there's any potential guy out there that I could have had, you know, you know, it'd be a sad shame if this whole Bill Lieb thing has been blocking me from them, right? Because... Um, as I was talking about with my last video is um, that you are an animal and because we have the three-part brain you have animal needs that need to be met you know kind of like you need to have sex some people need to do martial arts so that way they don't get into fights you know so you have to do something with that animal need to to have sex to fight you know to find food you gotta take care of your body well you also have to take care of that limbic center which is you need hugs and kisses, you know. That's why it's kind of good to have a pet, you know. Somebody that will let you pet them and hold them and kiss them in their forehead. So that um, that can be really bad for you if you don't have a sex partner, if you don't have a hugging partner. Uh, that can be bad for your mental health and your physical health. And it just all, you know, uh, it's it's like that. So anyways, um, having your personal needs met... Um, I think it's a small part of my problem, but it def definitely contributes to if um, if I'm suffering, you know, from poor mental health, um, that's where, you know, I'm not getting that nourishment from another person. Now, the narcissism in my life, I'm going to give that a bigger section. I'm putting about a quarter of that. I'm going to blame narcissistic abuse, okay? Now, it's not cool to just go through life blaming your problems on other people. Like, well, if it wasn't for this dick butt over here. Um, so, life is what happens to you, you know. So, to some extent, um, there's two things going on. Like, because you're responsible for the decisions you make and the way you react and everything. But you're not responsible for some of the things that are in your environment that you can't help. Like, being born into a narcissistic system and being treated like the scapegoat because, you know, I'm not the prettiest one or my, my grandma never liked my mom or whatever it tends to be, you know. Um, there, if you're part of a narcissistic system, there's usually somebody at the bottom that eats everyone's shit, and that's been me. And I feel like that's what carries over into the rest of your life, you know. And so it can carry over to the rest of your life because you kind of like get it becomes normal to you, maybe you know, so you have to learn to identify it before you can stand up to it, right? So in a roundabout way, I feel like that's the parallel of meeting Bill and Carol Ann because it, it makes me have to do that shadow work and reflect on what's wrong with me for one thing. But at the same time, it's because I've also walked into their narcissistic system where they already had a pre-existing issue going on between them and, you know, and me showing up with my uh, weird personality, I made an easy target or an easy victim to deflect some attention from their problem, you know. And so <laughs> that's the way I see it is that, you know, I was an easy victim. And so when we look at some of the reasons, like, for example, that people wanted to punish me. So there's certain people that wanted to jump on the bandwagon with Caroline and punish me. And it took me years to figure that out. And so that's why people go, well... How come you're still talking about this after all these years? Well, I really haven't had a way to like resolve it because um, they're able to just avoid me and ignore me. You know, like I can write them letters, I can call their phone, uh, particularly Bill. You know, like I can call his phone and get him to pick up and say hi to me, but he won't let me talk to him long enough to resolve any of this. And so, like, all you got to do is, like, you know, if it's Facebook, just block me off of Facebook, block me off of Mindphaser, just, 
you know, so you can just pretend you're ignoring everything I say all you want, but what I've noticed is since I started making YouTube videos and posting these on Facebook, um, people will tell him that, you know, there's been somebody out here posting weird shit about you. So, uh, so I have never really had the opportunity to be able to communicate in such a way that actually I feel like it's getting through, you know. So I've been asking um, to just be able to talk to Bill all this time. And he always acts like, well, he would talk to me, but there's somebody there that, you know, he, he doesn't have time for me because of these other people. And a lot of times it tends to be, uh, you know, the, the female partners that he has. And so, um, <laughs> now, and, and the way that matters today is like, I feel like he's been pulling the same trick on me since 98. I feel like it's been the same old story, just like, um, to this day, you know, he's polite to me and everything, but he, um, he acts like, you know, he's just busy right now. We'll try another time. He's busy right now. And there's been times I was like, I would talk to you, but I've got people with me. And it's always an excuse like this. And it makes me mad because he's been pulling this on me for so long. And I'm like, man, I am, it's making me feel stupid, you know? And so that's kind of like a passive aggressive form of narcissistic abuse, you know, where you're kind of making yourself look good and that way when the other person finally loses their temper then it makes them look really bad so it's kind of pertains to um bread crumbing and it pertains to uh reaction abuse if you can get the person to react then you be like aha it's all you anyways so you know i'm not i'm not a scholar i didn't go to school for psychology but i've been just learning as much psychology as it uh applies to me so I would say a bigger part of my problem is there just seems to be these people, you know. And, and there are a lot of people in my life. I feel like they don't understand what I'm saying and they refuse to understand. And some of these people I cons consider to be narcissist supporters. Now, just recently I had a girl named Teresa. Um, she was kind of introduced to me by Bill Lieb. You know, it just happened to be that she was sitting there when I called his phone one day. And so she got in touch with me. And she quit talking to him because he was lying to her about that other girlfriend and all that type of drama. And so as long as she's been in touch with me, she kind of acts like, you know, she's trying to be my friend, but she's been just trying to tell me to let go of Bill, you know. And and the type of stuff she says, you know, is very short-sighted. She keeps acting like she knows it. She, you know, it's like she comes from a place of supremacy. Like, I should just take her word for it, you know, because she's known him off and on over the years. She's been around all these people and she knows how they are. And, um, but, you know, she, she refuses to really understand the whole thing. And that's where, you know, I can't blame her, you know, like maybe she can't understand the whole thing, you know, but there's just a lot of people that, you know, they want to tell me what to do pretty much. Like you need to see the doctor, um, or you need to let it go. Uh, you need to get over this guy. And most importantly, you need to shut up. So I really feel like a lot of people are just saying, you just need to shut up about this. And that's where you feel like you're being ignored. So being ignored is really hard, you know, like when you know you have something you need to share, but people will ignore you. Um, <laughs> now, I guess before I get on to this, I want to talk about um, uh, Mark Passio. So, so as far as doing the shadow work goes, this is something he talks about. You really need to do the shadow work. You really need to look at what's wrong with you and clean that up, you know. And so we might also want to look at what happened to the industrial music scene. And what's happened, um, well, it's kind of a part of a bigger thing, really. It's more like, um, if you think about it, there's been a, a cultural revolution that's been going on since like the days of the beatniks and the hippies and all that. And that's a lot to do with um, the psychedelic experience, you know, really kind of help feel some of this. And so, um, so what I was going to say about Mark Passio is he talks about uh, the freedom movement. So the freedom movement kind of ties in with that. So it's really all kind of the same thing. And and the and the thing that's really hurt in his heart is that it's it's losing. So the freedom movement is losing. Uh, industrial music culture is part of this freedom movement in essence. So that's what's happening. Okay. So we might be looking at you know what's happening to our music scene. Um, we were originally anarchists, you know, if you know what anarchy even means, you know. It's really just a, 
it's really a utopia. It's a place of true freedom, this type of thing, you know. So it's it's probably a long haul to, to attain that state of anarchy. But, you know, the thing is, is um, what I'm experiencing is what he calls fake-ass anarchists, okay? So, you know, it's kind of the same thing as the Christians. The only thing worse than a fake-ass Christian is a fake-ass anarchist. And that's what I'm thinking with... Uh, the people I encounter in the like the the club scene and the you know the music scene here, as we've got a bunch of fake ass anarchists, and that's why people are willing to get behind someone like you know, Caroline Lopsidovsky, to punish me because you know, I shouldn't be talking to a married man or you know, I shouldn't be talking to a rock star or something like this so. Um, something Mark has been sharing lately, so he's been kind of recapping a lot of his old stuff, but he's also just been ranting and ranting about the people who just don't fucking listen. And so he shared a graph called the Dunning and Kruger effect. And so I have a similar issue, right? So Mark Passio's subject matter is that of, you know, natural law and uh, the occult and how it's being applied and all this stuff you need to understand for the achievement of anarchy so this is his line of study and he meets a lot of these people that get stuck right about here they only know so much about it but they get really arrogant and confident about what they think they know and they end up at the peak of mount stupid as he puts it so the dunning and kruger effect means that you know sometimes when people step into a new subject early on they get a very false sense of confidence and they end up actually just being fucking ig arrogant and ignorant in that case right so as you get further into your topic you come into what they call the valley of despair that's when you start to realize there's a lot more to learn than you think so you get humbled by the fact that you didn't know as much as you thought you did but then once you start to really master the subject it becomes a steady and gradual climb here so this happens a lot in uh, kung fu so um, I had a, my, my Kung Fu teacher from Florida that taught Kempo actually said this is what happens to people in the martial arts is, you know, when you're a white belt, you're kind of humble. Actually, you're, let's, let's put it here. Let's say you're the white belt and you're this humble. Like you're like, dude, I don't know anything about fighting. But the people that get like their green belt and brown belt start getting full of it. And some people get their black belts, especially if it's one of those systems where you get your black belt within like three to five years, you might get your black belt or second degree and start thinking you can kick everybody's ass. And, and some of these people end up in the hospital like that thinking they can kick everybody's ass. But then when you start to realize um, you can't kick everybody's ass and you're on that path of mastery, your um, humility level starts to get down about as close as it was where you started. So that's where... Um, you might go through this thinking you can kick everyone's ass. You get your ass kicked. But then when you start to really learn the truth behind the martial art. And so in my case, you know, I've been studying um, similar to uh, Mark Passy. I think you have a very similar uh, ideology about what we should be studying. And so for me, you know, going into visionary state and experiencing supernatural things has become my path of study for spiritual knowledge, for example, and so that's kind of where it starts for me. So my spiritual knowledge, my knowledge of the paranormal, psychic awareness, um, along with like industrial music culture and anything I care to discuss, I feel like, you know, I know what I know. And so I'll be bringing up, okay, this has been my experience with going into visionary state and how it led me to meet Bill Lee, right? So I share this much of my story with people and this is all they know about me. Okay, so I've been interested in this guy, Bill Lee, for a very long time. And everybody wants to tell me, well, they want to give me their advice. And they come from a really arrogant point of view where, like, they won't listen to me and get all this down here. They stop right about here. Again, now, some people aren't really meant to understand all this stuff. But the point being is, like... Everything else gets ignored once we get up to the part with Bill Lieb. Um, so you get all this advice. You need to see a doctor. You need to do this. You need to do that. Okay, so I posted that video, um, Compassion for a Curly Q. And somebody wrote in the comments, um, you've been fixated on Bill Lieb since the 90s, he said. Uh, 
you are clinically crazy and you just need to let it go. Now this is clearly somebody who didn't even watch my video, right? Because if he would have watched my video, I pretty much said the same thing that he did. As I really feel like, you know, I've been explaining in all these videos, like how I got interested in Bill Lee, right? So if you go back to the Jody vision, I've made over a hundred videos talking about this particular issue and other things that go along with it. So you can understand how I took an interest in Bill Lieb and why this has taken me so long to process. So you're not listening like, duh, I know I've been talking about this a long time and I know it makes me sound crazy. And that's also why I feel like I need to defend myself. Like it would make you look crazy too if it happened to you, right? So I get that. That's why I call it the crazy making experience. And, and it has, you know, I mean, I really feel that, um, you know, I may have some mental health issues that I came with when I met Bill and Caroline for the first time. But as far as I'm concerned, they've added to it, you know, meeting them and having to deal with their narcissistic abuse has actually contributed to, if I'm mentally ill, they've actually contributed to my condition. And then to have her actually try to tell me that I'm mentally ill. It's like, well, it was because of people like her and all of their narcissistic manipulation. And that's where, you know, uh, part of my joke and saying, well, whatever happened to Bill Lieb's balls? It's like, well, if you want to be involved with something like that, you have to let them cut you down to a size that they think they can manage. That's the kind of person you're dealing with. Those people, it's a type of narcissistic manipulation where they need to diminish you and make you believe that you are less than you are for them to be able to manage you. So this is the type of stuff I'm learning along the way. Now, <laughs> okay, so, you know, I don't want to be as mean as um, Mark Passio. He's like, you know, these people just want to pitch their tent right at the summit of fucking Mount Stupid and live there, right? They practically build a log cabin or build a, you know, a five-star hotel and plan on staying, you know, like build a condo up there for God's sake. So he's like making all this sarcastic. He loves to go on and on about how stupid people are, but I really think it's not a wise idea to project that onto people. I think it's also a part of being lazy. Like, you know, you don't really want to hear me out. Maybe it's none of your business. And, you know, if you really don't want to understand it, then maybe you should just stay out of the conversation. Like that person coming on and commenting, like, you know, what are you trying to give me your advice for if you're not going to listen to the video? It seems more of a power trip and, a, and an act of condescension, a condes, con, condescension. It's more of an act of condescension than it is an act of being helpful to me, you know? Nobody's helping me by saying stuff like that. And so that, you know, having to listen to people talk to me like that over the years, it kind of drives you crazy. It's kind of like the the bottom line in every horror story movement is you're experiencing something and you tell everybody about it and they can't believe you unless it happens to them. So, like, no one believes you. Nobody has the ears for it. That can drive a person absolutely insane. And so that's kind of what Mark Passio has been going on. Is that's just driving him crazy, right? So... Um, so that's why we want to look at like the bigger picture, you know, so like, you know, like I've been saying, I feel like part of what I'm doing is I'm sharing my life story. And the reason I talk about Billy is he's part of my life by default because he came to me in all these visions. It made me go seek him out. And so he just became the one. But, um, other than that, like maybe it was meant to, you know, so I'm over here, maybe it was this and maybe it was that still, you know, I'm still processing it. It was something that was made to make me think about industrial music. And so the bigger picture, as I've been saying, is it's really part of the freedom movement. And what Mark Passio is saying is the, the freedom movement is dying. Now, looking at Bill Lieb and the lack of his balls, right? <laughs> now, I think I've heard Frontline Assembly fans saying that because it just seemed like they were spending more time, like Anne Reese Fulber was doing Conjure One, like they want to spend more time on this, this woman's music than, you know, the good stuff like the industrial music. And well, my little joke about delirium has been that um, delirium is what frontline assembly fans play when their girlfriends come over because, you know, these guys want to be involved with women that aren't really into industrial music or whatever. And I feel like that's actually the case with Bill Lieb. It's almost like uh, his wife doesn't really care for frontline assembly and music like that, but she really supports delirium a lot. And I think since uh, Karma went over really good, that probably encouraged them to try to keep making more women's albums like that and she loves those so she's happy to do the graphics and everything and I think that 
she probably even listens to it on her own time, you know. So it's um not only what Frontline Assembly fans play for their girlfriends, it's what Bill Lieb plays for his wife. And so it seems like, you know, she kind of encourages him to go in more of a conventional direction. And, you know, if you look at the type of music she listens to, she really likes a lot of, you know, stuff that's from the radio, like, she likes the cars and like Tears for Fear. She likes Elton John and that type of stuff. Just she likes those concerts. It's like seven hundred bucks to go see the concert, you know, stuff like that. And um, so that's where I feel like um, what's happening is that people are trying to cater to the people around them that aren't interested in industrial music like this, or um, they're trying to cater to the club scene because you know maybe we've lost the wind in our sails, but. A lot of these people don't want to quit making music for a living and go work a regular job and who can blame them. So if I were them, I would rather, you know, if it was possible, keep making albums, even if they don't have the same amount of heart as they used to have, you know, um, it's still probably better than a lot of the other bullshit that people are making even then, you know, so that's why, you know, if we look at like what happened after 2000, I really think the whole scene has been kind of, you know, we're just getting old and we're just getting tired, you know, like they're saying, punk never died, it's just taking a nap, it's that kind of thing. And, you know, maybe a lot of our needs are being met as far as, like, what people have been fighting for, like, gay rights and all this type of thing, you know, the right to, to be able to have sex and the right to, to be able to wear a mohawk, you know, or whatever you want, you know, you want to have the right to wear tattoos or wear female underwear if you're a guy or whatever you want. But we've been fighting for the freedom to do all that, and now we're getting so much freedom that they're practically taking it and pounding it up our asses, like, okay. You know, so from now on, you know, everybody has to be gay and everybody has to get a sex change, you know. If you want it, then everyone's going to have to do it or you're going to be a weirdo. So it's almost getting to where, like, if you're not gay, you're not cool, you know. <laughs> like, um, I almost feel like people are joining the gay rights movement movement just to um to have more friends or something. Anyways, uh, but I'm but what we really should be calling it is the anti-bullying movement because what, you know, we all really want to have is the right to, you know, be our natural self and not have to live up to other people's expectations. And that's really all that's coming from. And so, you know, what we're doing is we're losing sight of the original purpose of the cultural revolution or industrial music itself. It seems to be its own special niche. I really feel like, you know, it's not exclusive, but I really do feel like it's in your karma if you feel a deep connection to industrial music. Like, I personally feel like I was born on time for industrial music and I was born on time for Frontline Assembly. And that's where I don't appreciate these women, you know, trying to run me off and treat me like the imposter. I'm like, dude, I was born for this. What are you talking about? You know? So like, I feel like it's more appropriate for someone like me to go up and talk to Bill Lieb than the person he's married to, as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, these people are treating me like I'm a threat to them because, you know, I probably have more in common with them than they do. And they'd really hate, you know, for me to be somebody he connects with. And then they have to, um, be ignored or whatever something like that so that's what I kind of I've been really dealing with this for a long time it's sort of my own personal issue but um again uh I think Bill Lieb represents somebody who's been like a good student of industrial music when I look at like Bill Lieb and Kevin Key and people like that I think you know that they were good students of this because I feel like um industrial music is a school of thought like so we want to go back to or what are the, the concepts and principles? So this is kind of like my Kempo teacher saying the same thing that Chris Cozy Fanny Tootie said of industrial music that people get caught up in the form, people get up, caught up in the appearance, but they don't get the spirit. So they get the form and they don't get the spirits. And that's why you have a lot of these sort of copyists out here, just imitation and the industrial bands and stuff like that. And so because of that, um, that's why we have all these people that it's like, it's more like a fashion contest or a popularity contest. And you have all these rumors of guys date raping women and stuff, you know, it's just, you know, it's not what it was meant to be. And it's just because, you know, the whole, um, the whole freedom movement is suffering. And so maybe it's, there just needs to be a kind of revival, you know, so again, we don't want to get caught up on form and appearance. It doesn't necessarily need to be industrial music. But if you go back to the root of it, you know, what, what industrial music started with was conversations and friendship, you know, so these guys were friends, the conversation, what was the conversation? You know, so these people were art students. So like, like the guys from Cabaret Voltaire are clearly art students. That's what their band is named for is their knowledge of history. So they knew the history of counterculture. You know, they knew about um, some stuff that was going on back in the twenties, for example, 
where they get their name Capri Voltaire, you know, and then uh, back to people like Throbbing Gristle or Genesis Peorge and those guys, they also believed in magic in the true sense and the use of psychedelics. So this is super taboo, you know, everything they deal with is super taboo. And it's all to do with um, having natural rights that are being taken away from us and they're gonna, um, they're gonna apply these anyways, right? So, um, <clears throat> now when you really think about what um, we've had to keep underground, um, magic is one of those. So, you know, there's like a war on information, there's a war on consciousness. Um, there's certain information that what we call the people in control don't want us to get because then it takes away their power. It could be empowering if you understand what magic really is and things like this. If you understand what your natural rights are, um, this is going to take away somebody else's power. So that's where we're moving out of, um, you know, slavery and moving into anarchy. And it's probably going to be a gradual progress, but that's what the, uh, the count, the, what you call the cultural revolution has really been about. And so when we're getting caught up in stuff like, you know, oh, well, look at the way she dresses. Look at her hair. Like, oh, my God, blah, 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 blah. It's like you're going back to high school. That's where I feel like, you know, you know, if you're wondering whatever happened to industrial music, it doesn't really matter that we revive industrial music or not. That's OK. You know, it really felt feels like it was meant to be when it was. And you can't really repeat that itself. And so I think the artists that are out there wondering, what am I going to do next? And I'm one of those people. That's why I'm a procrastinator is I really don't just want to be a copycat. I really think it's important to get back to the, um, the what's fundamental to the cultural revolution is, um, you know, that it's a truth movement. It's a freedom movement. And so like, you know, when I'm talking about like, here's what happened to me, you know, I went to Colorado looking for my music scene. And then what I ran into was an a narcissistic system well this is all part of um the shadow work we have to do is um recognizing what narcissism is because it's the root cause of uh the slave and master paradigm because it takes somebody that has the mentality of supremacy over others in order to be a narcissist in order to um participate in the slave and master relationship with others so you really have to do the shadow work and do the uh, learning. So anyways, um, I just wanted to touch on, you know, uh, you know, why, why am I talking about Bill Lieb and all this stuff? Because, well, somehow, you know, it was being put before me in these visions and, it, and it's meant to get my attention. It's meant to make me go through a process of realization in itself. So it, it could be a very personal issue. And if there's anything that he's received by knowing me, if there's been any benefit, or insight or uh, realization that he's had to have, you know, so be it. But um, I really think that, you know, one thing that we have in common is that we have a, a sentiment for industrial music and like the old guys, you know, like what they were doing in the 70s and, and into the 80s. And, um, and I really feel like, um, again, you can't, you don't want to just do that again, but what, we really want to look at what, what was behind it. And it was... Um, and then we have to go back before that, and what we had was the beats and the hippies, and you can go back before that, and if you keep going back further and further, and a lot of it's going to go back to witchcraft and magic as well. So witchcraft and magic are a part of this music in some way, and so uh, it kind of comes back to... Um, you know, we're, we're part of a collective that, you know, we're dealing with certain issues that are in our karma. Like, say, you know, we may have past tra life, tra uh, I call it past life trauma or post-traumatic stress of the soul, right? So we may have issues like this where we're not exclusive, but we're collective because we have a similar need. We could be part of a bigger soul group and all this nice stuff. And so that's where I feel like instead of walking away from the industrial scene, you know, or what's left of it, like, there's still, like, some family left, there's some tribe left, but, um, I kind of want to still give it my love and support instead of abandoning it, and I feel like maybe Bill Lieb represents that to me, he's kind of been somebody that headlines a lot of these big festivals and stuff, a lot of people associate him as being, you know, one of the, the best artists like that, a lot of people have been inspired by bands like him, and so he's kind of central, and, and kind of a major, you know, figure as far as this particular music scene goes, as well as somebody that I could relate to 
and somebody that I've had a lot of synchronicities with. But I really think, you know, aside from what's going on with me and with what's going on with him, I really think that it kind of it kind of reminds me how much I've uh, cared about industrial music all my life, and I'm and I've come across a few people on Facebook that really feel like um, the, our music scene is dying. It's just it's just gone really bad, and um, so I'm trying to troubleshoot this, and I really want to kind of continue telling my story about what happened from me meeting Bill Lee, but at the same time. Maybe kind of want to work more on um, the creative process and solutions to to uh, to revive our um, the spirit of our community. All right, you guys, let me uh, stop this right here, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye bye now.